Hey, good morning, church. Happy Sabbath. Perchance they're coming to you from my home in Loma Linda. I wish you well this morning. Uh, thank you for tuning in. Thank you for watching and listening. I'm enjoying the sunshine right in my face right now as I record, but it feels good. And it's good to be with you. Um, I'm going to share some songs today, today that I've pre-recorded. Um, it was a joy doing it for you. It was a, a unique experience to go through these songs uh, that have meant so much to me in my life and share them with you and uh, tune in, listen, and sing along with us wherever you are. Happy Sabbath. Welcome to our church program online today. 
we are still doing life together in different ways. And so today's announcement, I have three, four of them for you. And uh, here they are. The first one is that we are going to be decorating the outside of our church with amazing Christmas decorations. It's not as crazy as Dr. Bob's decorations, but it'll be just as awesome. So if you're like Rhonda Wilson and I, whose Christmas started in July, and you want to join us in decorating, show up here December 13 at 9 in the morning. Uh, that's a Sunday. That's about a week from now. And if you still have questions, uh, write this number down. It's 805-279-0393. Another one of your Christmas crazies. All right. The next thing we want to say is that tomorrow we have a crazy drive-by by the seniors of our church. I'm just kidding. It's our Christmas with the classics drive-in style and drive-by style. So you're going to pick up your dinner and leave. At 530, we will be waiting for you. Also, thank you so much to all of you who have given and pledged donations towards our Myrtlewood Wing Remodel Project. And there is still plenty of time for you to prayerfully consider how you would like to be part of this amazing ministry and rebuilding of our kitchen. <laughs> I was going to say chicken. <laughs> and our fellowship hall. And I don't know you, know, you know, you might even get some extra ice cream if we ever have potluck again. The last video that we want to show you is an announcement by Pastor Darren. Here it is. Hey church family, I have some exciting news. We are going to get to add a wonderful pastor temporarily to our pastoral team here at Cala Mesa Church. The Southeastern California Conference contacted me and our other pastors a few months back uh, telling us about Pastor Kazar Ackerman, uh, who's in a time of transition. They're looking for a full-time position for him uh, to have here in the conference. And until that happens, because sometimes it takes a little bit of time for God to lead in those ways, uh, the conference suggested that maybe we could have uh, Pastor Kazar join our team uh, temporarily until that takes place. And after talking with Kazar and having him talk with our pastoral staff, talking with our, some of our church leadership about it, um, seeing his gifts, his passion for ministry, his love for the Lord, we were excited to be able to have him join us uh, for however long we're able to have him. And I wanted to take some time this morning to have you get to know Pastor Kazar and his family. Well, I am excited to uh, share with you, church family, a new pastor that's going to be joining our team, Pastor Kazar. And to introduce him to you today, we have him and his wonderful family with us uh, just to get to know him a little bit better. And so Pastor Kazar, why don't I let you, you know, introduce your family or uh, you guys just take a moment to tell us a little bit about yourselves. Oh, this is my wife. Well, first of all, thank you, Darren, for um, uh, having this interview with us and just allowing us to introduce ourselves to the church. Um, well, we don't wanna take up too much time, but this is my wife. We've been married for 21 years. Awesome. And um, her name is Lewa, and this is, uh, this is Ezra, our youngest. She's seven years old, and she's in the second grade. And this is our son, Ezekiel, and he's in the fourth grade. He's nine years old, and we have a 17-year-old as well who is um, uh, not feeling well, I guess. And uh, so she won't be joining us. And then we have a 30-year-old son as well. He'll be 30 next week. And we have two grandchildren, five and six years old, two girls. So we're, we, we fit every category in the church as far as <laughs> youth and every stage. children's ministry, adult ministry, everything. I love it. Well, what a, what a wonderful family. What a blessing that must be, um, all of you together. What's something that you guys love to do together as a family? Uh, we recently like bike riding. We all, um, since the stay at home, uh, we try to find things to keep us busy and be active, or at least try to be, <laughs> and go outdoors. So we got bikes and we, we take the kids on bike rides. Um, we, go, we, we like to go to the beach and, and ride, yes, ride at the beach. We yeah. enjoy the beach, um, the park. Board games. Like yes, play some board, board games. games. Um, Monopoly. Then. And then um, we, we love to sing karaoke. Oh, awesome. <laughs> we are a karaoke. Yeah. 
Yeah, we fight over the mic over here. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man, that's awesome. Man, uh, sounds like it'd be a fun time to hang out with you guys and your family. Um, well, Kazar, could you tell us just a little bit about your ministry journey? I know when people ask me that question, you know, it's like, where do I start? Where do I end? But you know, just a little bit about uh, your journey as a pastor. Yeah, just quickly, my, my parents, you know, was raised in the Adventist home. My dad is a pastor. He's been a pastor since um, the late 70s, early 80s. So it's, it's been, he's still pastoring today in Utah. Um, I was a truck driver before I became a, a pastor, and I was driving trucks for 10 years. And then um, I went, I felt called to the ministry. We felt called, and I went to La Sierra University in 2008, graduated in 2012. And then um, I got hired right after that in August of 2012. And I've been ministering uh, churches, uh, Ontario Church. Um, I've been a um, the um, Campus Hill Church, the Chinese Church in Loma Linda, and now here with you in Tala Mesa. Wow. I know there's probably a lot of details you could share in all that time, but it's neat <laughs> to, to hear just a little bit of, of your journey. Um, I bet you got a lot of cool stories from your truck driving days. Oh, yeah. <laughs> truck driving is exciting, so yeah, <laughs> um, I'd recommend it to anyone. Awesome. Uh, well, we're so excited to have you on our, our team um, here at Cal Mesa. And uh, I just wanted to ask, what is something that excites you about ministry? I'm sure there's lots of things you like about ministry and you're passionate about. Otherwise, you wouldn't have made that transition, you know, as God was leading you out of that one career to uh, pastoring. But what's something that you could pinpoint that you really enjoy about ministry? I, I, I enjoy connecting with people. I mean, that's, that's who we deal with. The church is not a building. It's not a facility or, you know, um, a campus, as, you know, some may call it. it it's people. That's, that, that, that's what makes up the church. And so dealing with people, you know, being able to visit them and talk to them and connect with them, I think that's the greatest joy of ministry. And that, that's something that, I, that really excites me because you get to meet m many different types of people. Like I said, we work that... Um, Campus Hill Church and then Ontario Church and then the Chinese Church and so we we have our you know our network is is pretty broad out there with the different different ethnic groups and uh, the people that we created relationships throughout the years and so that's the biggest part of ministry that that I know my wife enjoys and my kids enjoy it too. It is difficult. It is different when we have to transition to new churches, but the beauty of it is that we get to meet more people, and I think that's that's the exciting part about it. And I can't wait to to uh, really, you know, touch bases with everyone and, and connect with as many church members as I can. Awesome. Uh, absolutely. Ministry is all about relationships and connecting with people. Um, and it's cool to hear the rich, diverse experience you've had in your um, ministry career in doing that in different contexts. Um, you kind of maybe already answered this, but is there something in particular that you're looking forward to as you join um, our Cala Mesa pastoral team and church family? I, I, I think, you know, just want to get our kids involved, um, you know, children's ministry, youth, and, and then um, uh, for myself, I just really want to um, assist anywhere that I can. I know you guys have a really wonderful pastoral team, and I, I you know, I've known some of them for some time, um, but it, it'll be interesting to see how I fit into the whole structure and what you guys are doing and be able to to help out in any areas. Um, I'm not an expert in one thing, but I do know how to do a whole bunch of other things. And so kind of a, a jack of all trades. And, and so I look forward to using, you know, some of those skills and the things that I've learned over the years in ministry and, and, and with, uh, you know, dealing with the church and the church facilities and things like that where I could be of assistance here at, at the Cala Mesa Church. So that, I'm really looking forward to that because in, in that position, I get to meet all types of different people because I'll, I'll be, you know, hopefully working in different areas of ministry uh, with the church, not only with you, but with other pastors and, and other directors for the departments. Awesome. Well, that is something that's really exciting to me. Um, 
that you're so versatile and so willing to just work wherever it's needed. And um, I just want to tell the church family that as you and I have talked, Kazar, and we've prayed through this, and as you've met with our staff, um, you know, we really feel that uh, the Lord has brought us together and that you are a great fit for us at this time. Um, and hopefully we can be a good fit for you and your family as well. And, and so we're excited about how God has led in this and um, just uh, glad that you're on board with us. And it's so awesome to meet your family. And we look forward to getting to know you guys better um, as we uh, get to know you. And we hopefully will we'll maybe be in person sometime soon. But, you know, sometimes we're yeah. going to know each other still through online formats. Um, but we look forward to getting to know you guys better. Thank you so much. Uh, and we're so excited to have you with us. Thank, Thank you, you so much you, for Pastor having Darren. us. Yeah, Thank you, Pastor it. Darren. Thank you. Yeah. And God bless you. God bless you. Yeah, yeah, we look forward welcome to, you. welcome okay. to all of you guys. Awesome. Thank you. This next song is a song titled, uh, They'll Know We Are Christians by Our Love. It was a song I remember first hearing when I was uh, at church camp as a kid in rural Kentucky. Um, I remember being around a campfire and listening to all these people on the top of a big hill at night as the stars were in the sky, <laughs> talking and, and singing songs. This was a, one of those songs. And my message to you with this song is to say, they'll know we are Christians by our love, not by how convincing we are on social media, not by our politics, not by our beliefs, but by our love. That's my message today. Good morning, Cal Mesa Church family, and Merry Christmas. I'm so excited to be here today to tell you a little bit more about one of the incredible organizations we get to help out this year with our Christmas offering. Beehive International is an organization that provides an education for adults so that they can learn a trade and support their families. It also helps educate their children, as well as supporting many orphanages in the area, all while spreading the love and gospel of Christ. This year, our church has the opportunity to help build a kitchen in the Beehive International Guest House. This is so important because a new family will be joining the Beehive team this year, bringing along with them many important skills in the medical field and contracting as well. On behalf of Beehive International, I thank you for being a part of this ministry. Merry Christmas. 
Hello church family, my name is Lizzie Frickman and I am the, this year's youth outreach leader. The youth outreach ministry has been blessed this year by being included in the Christmas budget. What we hope to do with this offering is first of all get involved with Fusion San Bernardino, um, begin packing care bags for the homeless regularly throughout the year, and continue to be connected with our community of neighbors right around the church. Thank you so much for your support as we are learning to be better servants for Christ and for others, both as a youth group and a church. Thank you so much. I hope you have a happy Sabbath and a Merry Christmas. Happy Sabbath, boys and girls. Welcome to Children's Story. Today we are going to be talking about the power of words. Now, there is a really cool Bible verse in Proverbs found in chapter 15, verse 4. And it goes like this. As a tree gives us fruit, healing words give us life. But evil words crush the spirit. Ouch! So today I'm going to show you about words using cotton balls and sandpaper. So if you were to describe a cotton ball, how would you describe it? Maybe use the word soft, fluffy. What else would you use? Mm, light. Yeah, that's a good word. Um, if I were to throw cotton balls at you, how do you think they would feel? Well, let's try it. Well, obviously you didn't feel that, but if you could feel it, obviously, it's really light, it's really soft, it doesn't hurt at all. Now, if words were cotton balls and they were kind words, what do you think these words would be? Maybe please, maybe thank you, um, you're awesome, great job, you are so brave, I love you. Yeah, those are all really, really kind words. Now imagine if those words were the ones you walked around with and you could like pelt people with this. Wouldn't it be awesome? I mean, they wouldn't even hurt like, hey, you're awesome, like, hey, good job, you're brave. Dude, I love you, like, that is so cool. Like, and you could just walk around life chucking kind words at people obviously nobody would ever get hurt. In fact, like the verse tells us, healing words give us life. 
In other words, you would be giving life. Isn't that awesome? Now, let's talk about my friend here, the sandpaper. Now, sandpaper, some of you guys may have used this. It's to make things smooth, but it's very, very rough. Literally, paper made out of sand, sandpaper. How would this feel if you rubbed it up against your arm? Ouch. Uh, you can't really see that, but I scratched myself. Um, let's see if I were to rub it on metal. What do you think would happen? Ooh, I don't know if you can see that, but that's all scratched up. And hmm, I brought some wood to see what it does to wood. And if you guys can see that a little bit, there's even stuff coming down because I'm sanding it. I'm making it smoother. I'm, I'm scratching this thing up. You know, it, it really creates some damage. And, you know, so kind words, although they give life, when we use mean words, like let's say mean words are sandpaper, um, it can even be like a mean voice. It could be maybe talking back. Maybe it could be like calling names or making fun of someone. That's what happens when we use sandpaper uh, as opposed to cotton balls. When we use mean words or mean voices, it can really, really, really cause some damage. And even if we try to use kind words over it, like that's not going to make the scratches go away. That is really not going to help this metal scratch go away. Sometimes they can cause some real damage. So we have to be super, super careful about what kind of words we use. Are we going to use kind words or are we going to use mean words, sandpaper words? So for example, let's say you and another kid want to share, want to use the same toys. What cotton ball words can you use to find a solution? Maybe, why don't we play together? Or, you know what, I've already had a turn. You go ahead and use it. Or you can say, you know what, let's take turns. I'll do five minutes and you do five minutes. They're kind words. You're saying, hey, I respect you. I'm giving you a priority. You are important. So kind words. But now let's say you and a kid want to use the same toy, but instead you use sandpaper words. You use mean words or a mean voice, which is going to work better. And I'm pretty sure you've all been in this situation before. And sometimes we've used mean words that hurt out. Or we've used kind words. And of course, duh, we all know the answer. Kind words are actually what are going to give you the solutions that you need in life. Just like our verse says, as a tree gives us fruit, healing words give us life. But evil words crush the spirit. So having a jar full of cotton balls or kind words as you go along is going to make the biggest difference in the world. In fact, I think I'm just going to keep this in my house. So every time I want to say something, I can be reminded that instead of saying mean words, I can totally throw kind words at them and they're never going to hurt. In fact, they are going to give life. I hope you enjoyed this story and we'll see you next time. Light of the world, you step down into darkness. Open my eyes, let me see. Beauty that made this heart adore you. Hope of a life spent with you. Here I am to worship. Here I am to bow down. Here I am to say that you're my God. Oh
exalted, oh so highly exalted, glorious in heaven above. Humbly you came to the earth you created, all full of sick became poor. Here I am to worship. Here I am to bow down, here I am to say that you're my God, you're all together lovely, all together worthy, all together wonderful to me, and I'll never know how much it costs to see. Upon that cross, and I'll never know how much it costs to see my sin upon that cross. So here I am to worship, here I am to bow down, here I am to say that you're my God. You're all together lovely, all together worthy, all together wonderful to me. So here I am to worship. Please bow your heads for prayer. Dear Jesus, thank you for this wonderful Sabbath day. Lord, with this year slowly coming to an end, I want to thank you for the perseverance and strength you have granted each and every one of us. We have all been through so much doubt and worry, but you have been there to comfort us. Lord, I want to raise up the families in our congregation who need your wisdom and guidance a little more this morning. Please bless them with your spirit and remind them of your unwavering promise. For the families who need medical attention, bring them peace of mind. For families who feel as though they have nowhere else to turn, bless them with your helping hand. For the families who feel as though they have strayed away from you, guide them back to your still waters. Lastly, I want to ask that you give everyone a sense of reflection during this holiday season. With the anxiety and stress of the holidays added on to the worries this year has brought, help us to remember the real reason why we are able to celebrate this season. We pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. So here I am to Words are incredibly powerful. I came across a book recently called Words Can Change Your Brain, The Neuroscience of Communication by Dr. Andrew Newberg and Mark Waldman. And in their book, they talk about how impactful negative words, negative thoughts have on the chemistry of our brains. In fact, they pointed out that if someone just reads a list of negative words for a few seconds, it can make a highly anxious or depressed person start to feel even worse. And the more that you ruminate on those negative words, the more you can actually damage key structures that regulate your memory, feelings, and emotions. You'll disrupt even your sleep patterns, your appetite, your ability to experience 
long-term happiness and satisfaction can even be threatened. Make no mistake, words are incredibly powerful. This fact is underlined all the more in Scripture. I'd like to invite you to go with me to Proverbs chapter 18. I'm just going to read one proverb, one tiny little verse, but packed into this tiny proverb was so much potency, it caused me to go to my knees and pray deeply this week, asking for the grace of Jesus because of the truth that it underlines. Proverbs 18.21 says, The tongue has the power of life and death, and those who love it will eat its fruit. The tongue has the power of life and death, and those who love it, that is, those to, who speak, who talk, those who love it will eat its fruit. In other words, they will have to face its consequences. That's a sobering passage. I like the way Eugene Peterson renders this verse in his paraphrase, the message. He says, words kill, words give life. They're either poison or fruit. You choose. Words are incredibly powerful. There's an old saying, sticks and stones can break my bones, but words will never hurt me. I always thought that was incorrect. That the saying should really go something more like, sticks and stones can break my bones, but words can crush my soul. I think most parents have been there when they've gotten to the point where they're just at their wits end with their little one. Maybe they aren't listening to your instructions or misbehaving. They've made a mess and won't clean it up after you've asked them 10 times. And then finally, you fly off the handle and you let them have it and you yell these harsh, negative words. And then you can just see their little heart shrink as they listen to you. Or maybe you found yourself finally blurting out in frustration your anger to your spouse. Something really harmful, hurtful, negative, and you can't take it back. There's no way to erase it. And you can just see the stain on their soul after you say it. Words are incredibly powerful. Solomon says that they're so powerful they can be used for life, for fruit. I found a simple example of how it can be used for fruit in a story in a book called In a Heartbeat. This book is written by Sean and Leanne Tui. Uh, you may know their names. They're the real-life couple portrayed in that movie, Blindside. They share this story in their book. I'd like to read it to you. There is a little-known congressional program that awards internships to young people who have aged out of, foster, out of the foster care system. These kids who were never adopted and are no longer eligible for state support. A senator we've met employed one such man as an intern. One morning, the senator breezed in for a meeting and discovered that his intern was already in the office, reorganizing the entire mailroom. The senator said to the intern, this is amazing. The mailroom has never looked so clean. You did a great job. A few minutes later, the senator saw that the intern had tears streaming down his face. Son, he said, are, are you okay? Yes, the intern answered quietly. Did I say something to offend you? No, sir. Well, what's wrong? To which the young man said, that's the first time in my life anyone's told me that I did something good. The Tuies go on to comment. A little bit of attention and a kind word. That's how little it takes to affect someone's life for the better. Words can be incredibly powerful. They can bring life, fruit, but they can also bring death, be poisonous came across a story written by a man named Keith Mames from Marion, Michigan, who writes the following. He's uh, recalling what his uh, daughter talked to him in a conversation after her soccer game. Dad, it really made us feel bad, said my ninth grade daughter after she climbed into the car following a recent game. She went on to tell how she and the girls on her team weren't sure what to do for the other team's star player. She was crying, Dad, kind of doubled over sometimes like she was too tired to keep going. But her coach just kept yelling. 
Ah, her coach. How could anyone have missed him? He was yelling from the moment the game began. He was barking commands and issuing demands with a harsh, guttural, barking tone. And with that method, he got his results. The girl, through tears none of us on the sidelines could see, and pain that we could not recognize, had been skillfully weaving her way through all of her defenders, all of our defenders, and had scored all the goals for our opposing team. She, in fact, was the key reason for our defeat at the end of the day. Still, despite these successes, her coach kept yelling, and his criticisms of her imperfections echoed across the field. But the worst of it, my daughter went on to say, is that the coach is her dad. I wonder what that young lady will remember, what she will think of when she gets home. Will she go home remembering, we won? Will she go home remembering, I scored all the goals for our team? I doubt it. What I think she will hear in her mind probably for years to come are the barking, angry demands of her father. Fruit or poison? Life or death? Words are incredibly powerful. What kind of words will you choose to speak to your spouse, to your kids, to your friends, to your brothers and sisters in this church? Will they be words of fruit or poison? Words that bring life or words that bring death? Family, in this time we are living when social and physical interactions have been so limited because of COVID, when Mask wearing makes it so we can't even see people's whole face when we interact with them in public, when we have to communicate more often through phone and text and email or electronic meetings. I feel like words are the one constant we still have. And in these times we're living in, I feel like it's so much easier to speak words that are poisonous because there's so much to be negative about. There's so much to complain about which is scary to me because in that book we cited earlier, Words Can Change Your Brain, they go on to say the brain barely responds to positive words and thoughts. To overcome the neural bias, as they put it, that the brain's natural, which is the brain's natural inclination for negativity, we must repetitiously and consciously generate as many positive thoughts as we can. We are inclined, it seems, to remember the negative, to focus on that. Don't you find that to be true in your own life sometimes? Come home from work and all you want to do is talk to your spouse about the one or two negative things someone said or did to you at the office and you leave out all the many positive things that happened. Ever have uh, someone say something to you that was really hurtful, really negative, and that's all you can think about when you see that person? even if they've apologized for it. And then those hurtful words that the person said seems to be what you always bring up when you talk to other people about them. I certainly have been there. I certainly have found myself especially being there in 2020. So much to complain about. So much to be negative over. So think about how important it is then to focus on and speak positively now. The marriage researcher John Gottman says that one of the most important things a married couple can do is to be more positive than negative. He states that one of the most simple findings in his research and experience over the years is that he's discovered that couples that are still married and are happy about it, they have at least a five to one ratio Five positive words to every one negative one. Five good hours for every hour of conflict. A five to one ratio at least. I don't know about you, but after reflecting on all that we've talked about so far, all this evidence about the effects of the negative words and the benefits of the positive ones, I am so motivated to change the way I talk. In fact, as I was preparing and rehearsing this message to bring to you this week, I found myself saying over and over, Lord, I'm going to have an even better than five to one ratio in my words and, and experiences with Beamy and the girls and my friends and church family. The positive is going to far outweigh the negative. 
But just as quickly as I got motivated to do that, I also got discouraged because I know me. I know that I'm not perfect. And it didn't help that in preparation for this message, I also looked up that well-known text in the book of James, chapter 3, where it talks about taming the tongue. In fact, I'd also like to read you that in Eugene Peterson's paraphrase, the message. Starting in verse 7, he says of James chapter 3, This is scary. You can tame a tiger, but you can't tame a tongue. It's never been done. The tongue runs wild, a wanton killer. With our tongues, we bless God, our Father. With the same tongues, we curse the very men and women He made in His image. Curses and blessings out of the same mouth. My friends, this can't go on. So how do I make sure that my words are fruit rather than poison when it seems hopeless, according to James, for me to do that? Well, maybe one more scripture can help us. I think it will help us because it reveals the root of this whole problem. We find that in Luke's gospel, the sixth chapter, starting in verse 45. It says, a good man brings good things out of the good stored up in his heart. And an evil man brings evil things out of the evil stored up in his heart. For the mouth speaks what the heart is full of. The words we speak come from what we've stored, what we've treasured, what we've rehearsed, what we've ruminated on in our hearts. So maybe if we want to have that good ratio that we need in our family, relationships with our spouse and our kids. If we want to make sure that the power of our words is used in a positive way, then we need to deal with what's stored up in the treasury of our hearts. Like we need to get rid of the types of words that may be stored up in there that maybe people have said to us that were negative and hurtful. Words like, not enough worthless, screw-up, idiot, unlovable, stupid. Whenever I accidentally say that word, my daughters are always quick to tell me, Daddy, that's a bad word. And yet sometimes that's what we treasure in our hearts, that word. Or loser. Maybe these are some of the words or thoughts that people have said about you and they've gotten stored there. Maybe these are words or thoughts that you've rehearsed over and over. And because of that, it's led to poisonous words coming out of your own mouth. We've got to change what's in the treasury of our hearts. And maybe we can start changing what's stored in the treasury of our hearts by replacing those negative words that we often ruminate on with God's words. You know what God says about you? He says you are chosen. He says you are his child, adopted, an heir to his kingdom, beloved, forgiven, righteous, redeemed, justified, free, and friend. He even calls you his masterpiece, his handiwork. That's what you need to put in the treasury of your heart. On the first day of class, Edward walked in a few minutes late. He sat down, slumped in his chair, lowered his, his head and folded his arms across his chest, didn't say anything, didn't smile, didn't even look up. Edward had just enrolled in Miss Audrey Hunt's music theory class, and this would be his demeanor for much of the semester. As time went on, Edward struggled to do well in this class. His homework and test scores were poor, so the teacher, Audrey, felt impressed to try and reach out to him and show a positive interest in him, tried to talk to him after class to encourage him, told him time and time again that she knew he could do better. Edward wasn't very responsive at first, but as she kept going, trying to show a positive interest in him, tell him encouraging words, it made a little bit of a difference in Edward's uh, life and in his time in the class. Got a little better, but not much improvement. Well, soon the end of the semester came and it was time for the final exam. And when Edward came up and handed his final exam to his teacher, 
he looked completely worn out and defeated. Audrey couldn't help but feel nervous for what Edward's grade would be. She knew that he was capable of so much more than he had given in that class, but she was fearful by the look on his face that his final grade would not be good. She wished him luck and reminded him that all the students were to come to her office Tuesday morning at 9 a.m. to receive their final grade from her. What she did every semester was to have students come one by one into her office to receive their final grade so she could discuss it with them. Tuesday morning came and it was time to hand out the grades. And sure enough, Edward's grade was not great. Um, she tallied up, Miss Audrey did, all of his work during the semester and put in that final grade on the final exam. And uh, turns out that Edward received a D. One by one, her students came in that Tuesday morning and she gave them their grades, but Edward was not to be seen. Audrey was about to head home after seeing her last student when Edward rushed into her office and said this. Sorry, and she said this to him first. Oh, I'm so glad you could make it, Edward. Please sit down and let's talk about your final grade. But before she could, could continue, this is what Edward said. I know that I am getting a low grade on my final. I realize that I have not been participating in class and that I am an embarrassment to others. I am lazy, selfish, stupid, and a good-for-nothing person. I have no place on this earth, and what's more, no one could ever love a person like me. I am a hopeless case with absolutely no future. As you can imagine, Audrey could not believe her ears. And in that moment, she did something that surprised herself. Edward, she said, your final grade is an A. What? You're giving me an A? Why would you give me an A when I did such a poor job in class on my assignments and on my final exam? Why would you do that? You may appear to be a D student, she said, but you are an A person. I believe in you. And I will always believe in you. I am here for you now and will always be here for you. Never, ever forget that. Now, go and create the life you dream of. Believe in yourself. I will be watching. And by the way, Edward, you are not unlovable. I love you. In all her years of teaching, Audrey had never done something like this or said such words to a student. Later that night, she found herself doubting what she did. Did I make a terrible mistake? She wondered, should I have done that? He didn't deserve an A, but just felt impressed to do it. Well, as she was thinking that over, she received a phone call. She received a phone call, and the other person on the line said, is this Edward's music theory teacher? Yes, Audrey replied. And he said, I am a pastor at Edward's church, and I have something I want to tell you. I want to thank you on behalf of Edward's family and myself for saving his life today. You see, Edward had been going through some bullying from his family and friends. Because of that, he had prepared to take his own life that day. The day he came to get his final grade, he had already written a note and left it on his pillow. It said, I am sorry that I could not be the kind of son and brother you wanted me to be. All I ever wanted to be was loved. I'm sorry for being unlovable. I will go now. You will find me in my closet. I'm sorry for any inconvenience I have caused you. Edward's plan was to see his teacher one last time before taking his own life. But then Audrey decided to give him that A. The pastor says, you told him that, that you believed in him, that you believed he was an A student, that he was lovable. And when you did that, something changed. He had never heard those words before in his life, and it gave him hope. And he didn't do what he was planning to do. That next semester, Edward re-enrolled in Miss Audrey's music theory class. And he worked hard and he earned a genuine A. In fact, today, Edward is the father of four beautiful children, has a wonderful wife, and he is a successful dentist in Southern California, donating much of his time to help abused children find love and acceptance and hope. Words are incredibly powerful. So powerful, in fact, that Solomon tells us they have the power to bring life or death. 
Ephesians chapter 4, verse 25, verse 29 tells us, Do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths, but only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs, that it may benefit those who listen. That's the way we need to communicate. That's how I want to communicate. And if that's your desire, then I want to invite you to start rehearsing. Start ruminating. Start focusing. Putting in the treasure of your heart what God says about you. We fall down, we lay our crowns at the feet of Jesus. The greatness of His mercy and love at the feet of Jesus. And we cry, oh. Let us pray. Father in heaven, we're so thankful for your thoughts and your words to us. May that be what we store up in the treasure of our hearts. May that be what we focus on, what we ruminate on, and not the negative, hurtful words that others might say about us or to us. And Lord, may that start to transform our hearts and our minds so that the words that come out of our mouth are healing and helpful and positive to others. Lord, give us the strength to do that, to tame our tongues, even though it's impossible, but with your words living in our hearts, Lord, maybe we can start to use our tongue to bring life. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. We cry home.